most advancement is actually pretty easy to evaluate. Right, like the hands-on stuff, camping, hiking, swimming. Yeah, right, you know, that kind of stuff is pretty easy to administer and judge, don't you think? Well, right, most of it. There's a few requirements, though, that are really challenging, like scout spirit. Yeah, that is a judgment call, isn't it? It can be really hard to know how to evaluate the, that. The other two that I usually have a little difficulty with are active participation and the one where you have to serve in a position of responsibility. Again, yes, they're much harder to judge. Um, it would be nice if we just had a universal definition that would tell us how to judge those requirements. I can agree with that, but uh, on the other hand, I think that one of the best things about advancement in scouting is that each scout really does get to be evaluated on his own efforts according to his set of skills, so it's pretty individual. So a universal numerical guideline wouldn't really fit for every I scout. I think you're right. One of the things that I really appreciate about the Guide to Advancement is the way that these kind of judgment call issues were addressed. Okay, so what we're going to talk about in this presentation is how to evaluate these judgment call requirements. And we'll begin by discussing reasonable expectations because that's a real important element to all of those requirements. Right, we like to be reasonable. Yes. Um, and the other ones that go along with this would be the active participation, scout spirit, and positions of responsibility. Okay, this all sounds really good, but whose standard of reasonable are we talking about? How do we know what reasonable means in well, this context? Well, that's why we called it judgment calls, because reasonable is going to mean different things to different people. A unit's allowed to establish expectations that are acceptable to its charter organization and its unit committee. Now, we don't want expectations for advancement purposes to be so demanding that they're impractical or impossible for today's youth and families to achieve. We need to allow our youth members to balance their lives with positive activities outside of scouting. So each individual unit is going to decide what's reasonable for them and for their scouts? That's right. And ultimately, a board of review decides what is reasonable or what is not. So these expectations might be different between one unit and another unit across yep. the country. Each unit is going to determine what works best for their youth members according to the way they administer the program. So my unit should come up with some kind of uh, formal numbers that our scouts have to So use. some units do find that useful, others don't. It's really up to the chartered organization and the committee. Okay, so those two groups work together to decide what's appropriate for that unit right. at That's that time. Right. Yep. Okay, well, what about standards for other things like parental involvement? Um, maybe I think it's reasonable that if a scout is in my unit, one of his parents should spend a certain number of hours volunteering with you the You know, troop. things like that and dues payments and uniforms and things. Of course, units are going to establish expectations about that. But let's separate those from the expectations directly related to a scout's level of activity because we're not going to consider any of those other expectations in evaluating the advancement requirement. So only the scout's own level of activity is evaluated by the That's board. That's right. Okay. Um, and how do the scouts know what the board is going to expect of them? Do they find this out when they sit down for their board of review? Oh, no. They, these expectations need to be shared and understood by all the scouts in the, in the unit as soon as they're established. So the scout shouldn't be surprised when he goes to have something signed off or goes to a board of review to find that there was something that was expected well, of him. Well, that wouldn't be very fair to the scout, would it? And he should really know and understand these reasonable expectations. Why don't we just make it easy and have national determine a percentage for attendance and participation? That's a fair question, but simply meeting a number is not really an adequate measure of the impact that the program has on an individual scout. You know, you can imagine in any given circumstance, there could be many different legitimate reasons why a scout didn't meet a numerical standard. So the national advancement team didn't see setting that number as being a very useful tool. So you're really letting each scout be judged in light of his own personal circumstances. That's correct, yeah. Okay. All right, so now I think I understand how reasonable expectations are determined. They're uh, put together by both the chartering organization and the committee far in advance and communicated to the scouts. My unit can choose a quantitative standard, but we don't That's have That's right. To. Some units find numbers useful, but many don't. Okay. Now, you said earlier that the way we evaluate this is by the impact that it has. Can we talk about that sure. a little bit? So when we're talking about impact, this is what we mean. Let's see how that concept 
and the reasonable expectations is applied to active participation. So now we're moving on to section 4.2.3.1. And the purpose of Star Life and Eagle Scout requirements calling for scouts to be active for a period of months involves this impact that we're talking about. Now we judge a member active if his level of activity in scouting, whether high or minimal, has made an impact on the community that they're living in and in the scout's life. Okay, so we're preparing young people to make a positive difference in the world, to make an impact on society, um, which really can't be determined by the number of outings or meetings they attend, but it uh, has to do with how the scout makes an impact on the world and how scouting has made an impact on the scout. You've got it. That's right. Okay, so if a scout meets the reasonable expectations that were set by his unit, then he fulfills the requirement for active participation. Yep, so long as he's registered and in good standing. Okay, but what if he doesn't meet the, the level of expectation that was set? Well, he can still fulfill the requirement. And how would he do that? Well, let's take a look at this three-part sequential test. Now, I know that this sounds very complex, but it's really pretty simple. And this is going to determine if the requirement has been met. And here's the three parts. First, the scout's registered. Second, the scout's in good standing. And third, the scout meets the unit's pre-established reasonable expectations, or alternatively, he provides an acceptable explanation of why he did not. Okay, so can we go through each of those sure. in detail? Now, the first two steps are really simple. Number one, the scout's registered, okay? That means that he's registered in his unit for at least the time period indicated in the requirement. He's indicated in some way through word or action that he considers himself a member of the unit. And we need to remember this. If a boy was supposed to have been registered, but for whatever reason was not, we need to get in touch with our local council registrar and see if there's a possibility of back registering him. Well, sometimes that happens. The adults don't file the paperwork properly, and in that case, we try to fix the problem and don't punish the scout for someone else's mistake. That's right. We never want to penalize a scout because an adult made a mistake. Now, the second test is that the scout is in good standing. And good standing with whom? A scout's considered in good standing with his unit as long as he hasn't been dismissed for disciplinary reasons. And he also needs to be in good standing with the local council and the Boy Scouts of America. Now, it would be a really rare case where he was not in good standing with the local council or the BSA. And in that case, communications would have been delivered to the unit. Okay, so this is not something that should come as a surprise. Almost every scout is easily going to pass these first two tests. That's right. I mean, the vast majority of scouts are registered and in good standing. That, these are pretty much administrative matters, and they shouldn't be misunderstood as anything else. Okay. Now, the third test is the scout meets the unit's pre-established reasonable expectations. Okay. And when you stay, say pre-established, this is what we were talking about a couple minutes ago. These are the ones that are determined by the unit committee and the chartered organization and communicated to the scouts well in advance of a board of That's review. That's right. A scout passes this test if he's met the unit's pre-established reasonable expectations for activity. Okay, great. But what happens if he doesn't meet those expectations? Well, alternatively, the scout must be allowed to provide an acceptable explanation of why he did not meet those expectations. So the board of review or the unit leader can choose to ask him why he didn't it's meet them? It's not really a choice. They must apply this alternative third test. It's not an option. Okay, so he has to be given an, an option to explain why he didn't meet these expectations. That's right. Okay, and what might be considered a reasonable explanation? So the first thing we'd want to look for are circumstances beyond the scout's control. In evaluating this requirement, we must consider if the scout would have been more active if he could have been. Okay, so maybe if the scout was ill for an extended period of time, he couldn't participate even though he might have wanted to. That's right. I mean, he may have been on a family trip or other family-related obligation that he really didn't have any choice in. So we're kind of asking if he was in control of the situation. That's right. If the circumstances beyond his control caused him to fall below the unit's pre-established reasonable expectations, then he's fulfilled the requirement. Okay. But what if he just hasn't been active for other reasons that weren't beyond his well, control? Well, there may be, of course, registered youth who appear to have zero level of activity. 
and maybe they're out of the country on an exchange program or away at school, but a conscientious leader is going to make a call and discover the scout's intentions. So it's the leader's responsibility to contact a scout that we haven't seen for a while and who appears to be inactive? That's right. That's what conscientious scout leaders do. Okay. Well, what about the, the more common case when it's a scout who hasn't met the pre-established expectations because he's involved in other activities? Well, we need to recognize all the worthwhile opportunities beyond scouting. A lot of times that's the explanation. That's why he's fallen short of the unit's expectations. And examples might include religious activities, schools, sports, or clubs. And all of these activities can also develop character, citizenship, or personal fitness. That's exactly what we're trying to do. So the additional learning and growth experiences activities like these provide can reinforce the lessons of scouting and also give young men the opportunity to put those lessons into practice in a different setting. So it's really more than just the number of meetings or outings he attends or even the hours that he spends with scouts, but it's other things he d does that complement his scouting experience or take his scouting experiences yeah, further. Yeah, it's reasonable to accept that competition for our scouts' time is really, really intense, especially as they get a little older. Now, they want to take advantage of all these positive outside opportunities, and that's great. This can make full-time dedication to his unit a little difficult to balance. And so fair scout leaders, therefore, are going to find ways to empower the scouts that we serve to plan growth opportunities both inside and outside of scouting. I'd consider them part of an overall positive life experience, and that's what the Boy Scouts of America is trying to do, right? That's our driving force. There seems to be a lot of abstract concepts here. How would we apply these in the case of a specific scout? Well, let's use an example. Here's John Smith. I bet you took a long time coming up with that well, name. Well, no, it really didn't take me very long at all. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so John's a star scout. He's an assistant senior patrol leader. He's a sophomore in high school. He's an OA Lodge officer. He's on the debate team at school, and he's a youth group leader in his church. So... Let's say John goes to his board of review and he meets the first two tests, right? So he is registered and he's in good standing, but he didn't meet the pre-established reasonable expectations for activity that his troop had made. Okay. So in that case, we would go to the alternative to the third test. That's right. Okay. So uh, we would ask him if there was anything beyond his control that affected his level of activity. Right. Like, you know, a long-term illness or long convalescence or family obligations that kept him away from scouts, things that he had no control over. Okay. Let's say we've asked him that and the answer is no. Okay. So then we would ask him what else affected his level of activity. That's right. So what would you ask him to try and figure that out? Um, I would probably start by asking him how these other things he was involved with maybe conflicted with his troop schedule. So maybe the OA Lodge officer meeting is the same night as the troop meeting. And maybe his church youth group leader responsibilities took him away for a weekend that we were out camping or something. Mm -hmm. But could you see your way, clear if you were sitting on that border review, to finding a way that John has fulfilled that requirement? Yeah, I think he has. He's as active in the troop as he's able to be with his other mm -hmm. activities. But it also comes back to the question of impact that we talked about earlier. He's taking the things that he's learned in scouting to these organizations and making an impact on the community, which is exactly the kind of thing that we want our youth to be doing. That's right. I think as far as impact goes and that concept, John is a really good example of that. Talking about all that takes us right into the scout spirit requirement. Scouts who incorporate the ideals of the Scout Oath and the Scout Law, the Scout Motto and the Scout Slogan and all that into their daily lives are said to have Scout Spirit. That's what we call Scout Spirit. Okay, so there really is no way to quantify Scout Spirit. It's always going to be a judgment call, and we come up with an answer by asking the Scouts questions about how they apply these things in their daily lives. That's right. We can't really measure Scout Spirit by counting meetings and outings and attendance but by the way that they live their lives. So we're going to ask them how they fulfilled the requirement and see what kind of explanation they have for us. And sometimes those are the most interesting answers. That's right. And it also provides a really good opportunity for a unit leader or a board of review to get to know a lot more about the scout. And sometimes asking them about times when they haven't applied these ideals as much as they would have liked to can be very insightful as well. Uh, that can be kind of a sensitive issue, and we need to treat things like that very carefully. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, most scout leaders do their best to live by the scout oath and law, but any one of them can look back on years past and wish that at times they had acted differently. We learn from these experiences, we improve and grow, and that's what we're looking for in our scouts. Sometimes we learn the most from our mistakes. That's right. And our youth grow into the kind of people that we are trying to make them. That's right. So scout spirit is not that mm -hmm. hard to work with when we start talking to the scout. Okay. So we've talked about active participation and we've talked about scout spirit. Another one of the judgment calls has to do with positions of responsibility. For the ranks of Star Life and Eagle, a scout has to serve in a position of responsibility listed in the requirements for that rank. Does that mean he has to serve in the, that position for the entire time? No, he can actually serve in several different positions so long as the total term of service fulfills the requirement. So he could be a patrol leader for two months and then do nothing for two months and then be a quartermaster for another two months and that would be counted as four months towards his position? That's right. What if he wants to get through it quickly? Can he serve in two positions at the same time for three months and count that as six months? No, not really. I mean, what you described would not be considered fulfilling the requirement. You know, that and we'd rather our scouts focused on one set of responsibilities. So holding more than one position at the same time is discouraged. It does. Yeah, it does split their focus. That's right. Okay, so now wait a minute. Aren't these called leadership positions? Well, some positions of responsibility are focused on leadership and some are focused on supporting uh, scouts in various ways. Okay, so a scout who's a patrol leader, that's a leadership position. Of course, yeah, that's a leadership position, but it's also a position of responsibility, isn't it? I mean, a patrol leader's position of responsibility is focused on leading his patrol. That's a different focus than a position like maybe scribe or quartermaster who are focused on supporting their fellow scouts in other ways. But a quartermaster or a scribe, they're not leadership positions anymore? Just like they have always been, those roles are going to have elements of leadership. I mean, a quartermaster or scribe is going to direct other scouts at times, and he's also going to provide a strong example. Okay, so now I'm really confused. Well, don't be confused, because every position for Star, Life, and Eagle is a position of responsibility. We're just not differentiating between those that focus on leadership and those that don't. So we're not emphasizing scouts learning leadership skills anymore? Oh, no, we're continuing to instill leadership. Taking and accepting responsibility is a real key foundation for leadership. Nobody can be a real leader without responsibility. The requirement recognizes that, you know, we're all different. We have different personalities and talents and sets of skills. Some of us are destined to be leaders of the group and others to provide quality support and strong examples, more or less behind the scenes. Okay, I think that makes more sense. So all these positions of leadership, some involve leading other scouts, some involve uh, more organization type things, but they all involve responsibility. So using the term position of responsibility is just a more accurate description of what's been going on in scouting for 100 years. It doesn't signal a change of direction in the program. So only the positions that are listed in the requirement are acceptable for meeting this requirement? For SAR and Life Ranks, a unit leader does have an option. He can assign a leadership project as a substitute for a position of responsibility. Now, if they're going to do that, he or she should consult the unit committee and the unit advancement coordinator to arrive at suitable standards. The experience a scout gets from that leadership project should provide lessons similar to those listed in positions of responsibility, but it must not be confused with or compared to the scope of an Eagle Scout service project. Okay, so we're back to these projects have to have pre-established reasonable expectations that are communicated to the scout before he begins. You've got it. So with all these positions of responsibility, some scouts take it and run with it and mm -hmm. other scouts don't do as much. So how do we decide what level of performance meets the requirement of being in a position of responsibility. Okay, so when, we, when a scout assumes a position of responsibility, something related to the desired results have to happen. It wouldn't be very fair to the scout, at, nor to the unit that he's in, to reward him for work that he's never done. Producing absolutely no results isn't very acceptable, is it? Okay, some degree of responsibility has to be evident. Okay, so if the scout is holding the position of responsibility but isn't actually doing anything, then he's not fulfilling the requirement. That's right, but we need to remember that this whole thing is a partnership between the scout and his adult leaders. We shouldn't let situations like this happen. That's our responsibility. When a scout takes on a position of responsibility, we need to be sure that there are clear expectations and that we provide an ongoing coaching and mentoring role for them. So again, we're back to reasonable, pre-established expectations. That's right. The same concept applies here. 
And are these expectations set by the unit as well? Yep. There's information in the Scoutmaster's Handbook that suggests specific responsibilities for all the different positions listed for Star Life and Eagle. So I just use the de job descriptions in the Scoutmaster's Handbook and stick with those? Well, the job descriptions are there to help you and the Scout determine what the expectations will be. It's not a set of rules. Okay, so I start there, but then work with the Scout individually to set expectations that work for them and for the unit. That's right. When a scout takes on a position of responsibility, everybody, the scout, the committee, the unit advancement coordinator, the unit leader should fully understand what's expected of them. Wow. I guess since we're talking about sharing these expectations with everybody, it has to be they have to be pretty important. Yep, shared expectations that are discussed and agreed on aid the evaluation of the position of responsibility, and they can save a lot of wrangling down the road. That way, if the scout meets them based on his own personal skill set, he's completed the requirement. So what if this didn't happen? What if we didn't set expectations? Well, in this case, it's left up to the scout to determine what should be done. It'd be great, of course, if an assistant scoutmaster or another adult leader could help with this, but otherwise, the scout's going to determine what should have been done, right? I mean, if we give him a job, then he's going to figure out what he needs to do. And if he makes a reasonable effort to take on those responsibilities for the time specified, then he fulfills the requirement. Okay, well, that sounds fair. But what if the adults don't agree with what the scout thought was reasonable for the position? Even if his results aren't necessarily what the scoutmaster or the members of the board of review or others involved may want to see, he can't be held to unestablished expectations. Okay, so really it's unfair to impose expectations after the fact. Okay, so what about the scout who's been in the position, but, and we've communicated the expectations, but he hasn't done anything? So a responsible unit leader is mentoring and coaching their scouts on a continuous basis. I mean, if they think a scout is not taking responsibility, they need to communicate with him pretty much right away and work with him to help him improve and ask him what he thinks he should be accomplishing. I mean, what is his concept of the position? What does he think his unit leaders expect? What has he done well? What needs improvement? Often this kind of questioning approach can lead a young man to the decision to measure up. So we don't just throw the scouts into a position and then tell them a couple months later that they don't measure up. That's right. I mean, that's really not what scouting's about. Well, suppose we have talked to the scout and he's still not performing up to our expectations. All right, so if it becomes clear nothing is going to improve his performance, if we've coached, if we've talked to him, it's acceptable to remove him from the position. Every effort should be made that while he was in the position to ensure he understood the expectations, he was regularly supported towards reasonably acceptable performance. It is unfair and un inappropriate after six months, for example, to surprise a boy who thinks he's been doing fine with news that his performance is now considered unsatisfactory for some reason. Even in that case, he must be given credit for the time that he served. Only in the rarest of cases, if ever, should unit leaders inform a scout that time once served will not count. Okay. And what if the scout doesn't agree with the decision of his unit leaders? If a scout believes he's done well and he's performed his duty satisfactorily, but if the unit leaders disagree, then the possibility that the expectations are unreasonable should be considered. So we have a discussion between the scout and his leaders and maybe include his parents or guardians. If he believes after all that he's still being held to unreasonable expectations, he should complete the rest of the requirements for the rank that he's working towards and be granted a board of review. Why would he be granted a board of review? Although it's rare that discussions won't resolve the disagreement, every opportunity to be heard should be granted to the scout. A board of review can listen to him and make a decision on the matter. Okay, and if he's an, uh, an Eagle candidate, is there, there's a special board of review, isn't there? That's right. If he's an Eagle candidate, then he may request a what's called a board of review under disputed circumstances. And you can read about that in section 8.0.3.2. So that's the basics on how to make these judgment call kind of evaluations in advancement. So in every case, we're giving the scout every opportunity to succeed. We're telling him in advance what we're expecting of him. We're coaching him along the way and letting him uh, provide explanations when things don't work out as we had hoped. That's right. Advancement should be challenging and it should be rigorous, but it shouldn't be impossible and it shouldn't be discouraging to a scout. We want them to have every opportunity to succeed.